extravagant coffee grinders are everywhere these days. You can now spend upwards of $5,000 on a machine intended for home use, guaranteeing the perfect cup, whatever that is. But do you wonder if there are any gems at the other end of the scale? I mean, dirt-cheap workhorses that do a respectable job. You can find plenty if you know what to look for, but there are some people who, it seems, are determined to shut down debate by gadget-shaming regular folks like us. I'd be pleased to put a stop to that and spread some good news based on evidence. Now, I don't like to be a troublemaker, but a lot of tryhards are going to start howling when I begin to preach it. So for this episode, I'm going to illustrate my point before showing my hand. I'll follow that with a tutorial explaining how to get the most performance from the least expense. Forgive the coyness. You know that's not my style. But I don't want those prejudiced souls to click away before I present the facts. I look forward to reading the flames I'll probably attract, but I'd like to perform a few straightforward demonstrations before the noobs begin to cry. Oh my God. It's like a miracle. I've got four samples of the same coffee ground on different machines. Each of them was dialed in for a four-minute pour-over. Why pour-over? Simply because the particles are easy to see. I could grind for Turkish or espresso, but we'd need a microscope to judge it. I've separated out the very large and very small bits using ordinary kitchen sieves. This way we can look at pieces that are big enough to evaluate, but not huge and misshapen. The fine particles are too small to see clearly, so they're just visual noise that we can do without. Let's consider what lies between. We'll examine the middle slice from four specimens weighing 10 grams each. Sample 1 has got a lot of angular bits of varying shapes and sizes. This grinder is exposing a lot of surface area, which makes for good extraction. Grinder 2 also produces a lot of angular bits, although they're slightly chunkier than sample 1's and a bit more uniform, but they're not terribly different. Sample 3 has more rounded particles. This is a noticeable difference, but not a big one. Interestingly, this grinder produced the smallest number of boulders. Sample 4 has a lot of chunky, angular bits with fairly consistent shapes, much like Sample 2. This grinder produced the greatest number of boulders, but otherwise it did well. Let's compare what I consider the best-looking sample, number 1, to the worst, number 3, so that we can appreciate the range of difference between expensive and cheap units. Sample 1 came from the second most expensive grinder. Sample 3 came from the cheapest one. The thing is, they're not that far apart. The difference in price here is big, but the difference in quality is relatively small. The overall size distribution is similar, and they're in the same ballpark in terms of particle shape, although Grinder 3 clearly makes bits that are more spherical than I would like. This sample is a bit disappointing compared to the others, until you learn that it came from a $20 blade grinder. Yes, a blade grinder, the mechanical Krampus of coffee legend. Like most monsters, it's not as bad as we've been led to believe. In fact, it's quite good when you consider the price. Let's match all of the grinders to their output. Sample 1 is from the Eureka Mignon Specialita, which uses 55 mm flat burrs. Sample 2 is from the Niche Zero with 63 mm conical burrs. Sample 4 is from the Easy Presso JE Plus with 47 mm conical burrs. And Sample 3 is from the Krupp's El Cheapo Blade Grinder. Now, you might have used a blade grinder and had trouble getting a decent result like this. There are a few tricks, which I'll show you now. 
If you just fill it and press the button, the blades will chase the coffee around with no resistance. The coffee will behave like a fluid and it will be ground very unevenly. So let me show you how to overcome this problem and actually dial in your grind. First, we need the right amount of coffee to provide some resistance, but not too much. This will vary from one grinder to another, but the sweet spot on mine is a dose between 30 and 40 grams. You'll have to experiment to find yours. Second, the coffee particles will end up segregated by size, with fines clinging to each other in clumps below the blades and larger bits whizzing around above. So we need to redistribute the coffee by shaking the grinder up and down. Yes, this is probably bad for it, but remember, it's a $20 gadget I'm abusing here. Third, we need to add resistance by moving the unit in a circle against the flow. Mine turns anti-clockwise, so I move the device clockwise. And finally, the only way to dial in your grind is by timing it, so you need to watch the clock. I start on the 5 second mark. I want a 13 second grind for this sample, so I stop at 18 seconds. It makes no difference what your reaction time is, so long as it's consistent. With a bit of practice, you'll find that this is repeatable, hence adjustable. You can actually dial in for different brewing methods, different coffees, and different doses using time alone. But be warned, a couple of seconds can make a noticeable difference. I'll admit freely that the blade grinder is nothing special, but it's hardly the disaster that coffee experts on YouTube and Reddit insist that it is. Many of the more authoritative, or authoritarian, voices belong to the cafe-trained echo chamber and its hangers-on, and they share a tendency to repeat established beliefs without questioning them. Naturally, the Wired Gourmet disdains conventional wisdom and proverbs. Around here, we put opinions to the test. If it works, it's right. If it tastes good, it is good. A blade grinder can make a decent cup using several different brewing methods, although it will not work with Turkish coffee or espresso, and there's no getting around it. So why should there be such intense hatred toward this inoffensive little gizmo? One reason is the coffee industry's priorities. Clearly, this would be useless in a cafe, so we assume it must be crap. Another reason is after-purchase insecurity. If you spend 500 or 600 bucks or more on a fancy new grinder, you're going to experience a placebo effect. All of your coffee will suddenly taste a lot better. You'll wonder how you ever made a tolerable cup with that crummy old blade grinder, and you'll scoff at anybody still using one. That's just how the mind works. Finally, we have the indestructible fallacy that uneven grit size makes coffee undrinkable. Even the finest commercial grinders produce inconsistent particle sizes over a broad range, but so long as the device costs hundreds, if not thousands, that's a feature, not a bug, whereas the inconsistency associated with blade grinders is diabolical. This distribution is from the Specialita. This one is from the Cheapo blade grinder. They look pretty similar to me. However, blade grinder particles are unique. They tend to be roughly spherical. A sphere has the smallest surface area per unit of volume of any three-dimensional form and is, therefore, the least efficient shape for extraction. And that creates a small but noticeable flavor penalty. You can compensate a bit by grinding finer, but don't overdo it because you can run into problems with flow characteristics and timing, yielding bitter and astringent flavors. Very fine particles will extract readily, even when they're badly shaped, but if there are so many fines that your pour-over chokes and runs six or seven minutes, I doubt the coffee in your cup is going to make you smile. Here's the aftermath of a typical four-minute pour-over that I prepared using the Niche Zero. Looks all right, doesn't it? Now, here's one where I deliberately ground too long using the blade grinder. This was about a 15-second grind, and the brew lasted around six and a half minutes. Notice the layer of silt on top. These extremely fine particles will create unpleasant flavors with a contact time of, say, five minutes or more.
But it's wrong to say that a blade grinder can't make a decent cup of coffee. That's a fable. It can't make good Turkish coffee, which it would leave gritty, or espresso, which requires precise and repeatable flow resistance. But otherwise, if you learn to dial it in, it's not that bad, especially when you consider how little it costs. The evidence is right here. The grind quality is only slightly worse than what I get from three excellent prosumer devices. If you can live without espresso or Turkish coffee at home, and a high-quality machine is outside your budget, then a blade grinder, used with understanding and a bit of skill, will serve you better than a cheap electric burr grinder, because cheap, in that context, is still kind of expensive. The burr grinder has fixed capabilities, it's only as good as it was made to be, and if that's not good enough, you're stuck. A blade grinder is so uncomplicated, you can improve its performance substantially by interacting with it, as I showed you. When you consider value for money, the blade grinder wins. Think of it this way. If you spend 150 bucks and you still need to use a pressurized portafilter basket, then you wasted 130 because here's a $20 gadget that operates in the same performance range. Plus, this one is smaller, quieter, faster, and a lot easier to clean. Okay, but what if you're budget conscious, but you want good quality fine grinding? In that case, you'll be well served with a moderately priced manual burr grinder, like the Orphan Lido series, or the Easy Presso JX or JE series, or the Time More X. They'll give you high quality results in the very fine range without costing an arm and a leg. A cheap electric one really won't take you there. Don't reflexively turn your nose up at a blade grinder. It's good enough for the mocha pot, AeroPress, paper filtered pour over, and the French press. That's a lot of versatility for a measly 20 bucks. You just need to learn how to work with it. Well, that's about all I've got today. I haven't decided what I'm going to do next, but I'm sure it'll be extremely interesting. So keep in touch. Cheers.